remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Dong, the witch is dead. That is right. Eric Cantor voted out of office in a primary of all things earlier this week. It is I, once again, ladies and gentlemen, America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you for another week of eye gouging, crotch kicking, no holds barred political and societal analysis. And as the violent femmes once sang, Eric Cantor is gone, daddy gone. And as I saw the results come in last night, I'm taping this on Wednesday night, the election happened on Tuesday, everybody was in shock on all sides of the aisle, all television networks. It was one of the most interesting things I've ever seen in, in terms of political commentary and, and how people reacted to it. This came out of nowhere. Eric Cantor, a guy who at one point tried to pretend as though he was among those of us in the Tea Party, and then kind of tried to quietly turn his back on us. Well, it wasn't quiet enough. We found out about it, and you lost by 11 points, buddy. And and the shock that everybody's showing, both in the Democratic side and the Republican side, just proves to me how out of touch that mainstream Republicans and Democrats are with what mainstream America in the Midwest and the South actually believe about certain things. The fact that this could come as so much of a shock, so out of nowhere, tells you that you really don't know where most of us are coming from at all. And the funniest thing I saw, the most entertaining thing to me was on Twitter. I saw so many liberals on Twitter who were saying things like, I can't believe it. Eric Cantor got voted out of office because he wasn't conservative enough. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> you know, just as an aside, I, I, I have to say I, I'm... Even today, I'm shocked that there are still people out there, still people among you liberals, who are shocked that there could possibly be politicians out there more conservative than a guy like Eric Cantor. And I even go back further. I think back to uh, the George W. Bush years when he was president. And I would hear liberals and people on, in, on television talk about how uh, George W. Bush was just the most crazy right-wing nut job extremist ever. And I'm thinking, wait, there's a whole lot of us conservatives out here who are upset that Bush isn't conservative enough. We were mad that he was spending money in education and sending money to Africa for AIDS and all this other crap. And even back then, I thought, man, if these liberals who are saying this, if they ever actually were to meet a real dyed-in-the-wool conservative, they'd probably crap themselves. They... It would be shocking to them that someone like us could even exist, but we do. There's a lot of us around. We uh, interact with you every day. So I have to wonder what kind of sheltered life some of these liberals live that they never seem to come in contact with anybody further to the right than an Eric Cantor or a George W. Bush. And I don't say that in a, in a mean way or dismissive way. It's something that I find very interesting and I'm genuinely curious about it. I mean, I would think that unless you live on a college campus or maybe in like a big city somewhere, if you live anywhere else in the suburbs or anywhere like that, that you would be around a lot of people that are more far to the right than Eric Cantor. You just may not know it, you know, but we're working right alongside with you at your job or we're on the next treadmill over the gym or we're smiling at you on the freeway as we pass you by. We're all over the place. Maybe you don't realize it. Wasn't there a, some, a columnist in the New Yorker back in 1972 that, when uh, Richard Nixon blew out George McGovern, she wrote an article and said, I don't know how Nixon won that election. I didn't know anybody that voted for him. Maybe we're seeing another disconnect like that today. But anyhow, once Cantor lost, commentators on all sides were kind of fumbling for an explanation of why it happened or how it happened. Was it the Tea Party or was it not the Tea Party? Was it the immigration thing? Were a bunch of Democratic, Democrats crossing over in an open primary to vote just for the hell of it? Well, I'm going to give you the real reason. And in giving you the real reason, I'm going to explain something to a lot of you uh, that you talk about a lot, but a lot of you, I'm not sure that you really know. So I'm going to give you the 411 on it tonight. First of all, the explanation for this was that, yes, the Cantor loss was a Tea Party win. Now, some of you are going to hear me say that, and you're immediately going to say, well, the Tea Party organizations didn't contribute hardly any money down there, so how could it be a Tea Party win? 
That's the first place that I, I need to bring up speed on. When people talk about the Tea Party, when, when people who are in the Tea Party, such as myself, talk about ourselves, when we talk about the Tea Party, we are not talking about an organized group. We're not talking about an organization. We're not talking about a fundraising operation. We're not talking about a structured entity. Yes, there are groups out there that use the Tea Party name to raise money, contribute to elections, endorse candidates, whatever. There's several of them out there. But most of us who are actual Tea Partiers don't really pay a lot of attention to those groups. Maybe we're on their emailing list somewhere, or you know, maybe we uh, throw them a couple of bucks here or there, but really we don't wait for what those people to say for us to make a decision. We kind of go where we want to go and do what we want to do. So the fact that the Tea Party groups didn't spend a lot of money in this, don't, don't think that disqualifies the Tea Party from having an influence because you need to understand who the Tea Party really is. Some people will call us the hard right, the extreme conservatives. I like the version, I like the word Tea Party because everybody instantly knows what it is and it just cuts to the chase. But who are the Tea Party? A lot of you talk about us, but you don't really know who we are. Let me tell you who the Tea Party is. The Tea Party is a number of different groups of conservative voters, all of which upset with government as it currently is running, all of which who believe government largely needs to back the hell off and we need to reduce tremendous amounts of government and eliminate a lot of it in order to more efficiently move society forward. Now, there's a lot of different groups within that that have their different pet issues that comprise the Tea Party. So it's not just one fringe group. Within the Tea Party, yes, you have your fiscal conservatives that want to reduce spending and reduce government. You also have your kind of your pro-gun people, your Second Amendment uh, your, your Second Amendment guardians that are out there who that's their primary issue is guns and the protection of our rights to bear arms. You also have a lot of people like me who are social conservatives who look around at the lack of morality in society and American culture as a whole and say, holy crap, we're in trouble. And yeah, you even have some of those kind of Alex Jones show conspiracy theory type people. All of those people are in this Tea Party group. But what makes it work is that even though you have all these different people, all this diversity within the Tea Party, I bet you never thought you'd hear that phrase, did you? You have all this diversity within the Tea Party, and yet there's not really much in the way of conflict between these groups because there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of uh, congruity, if I can make up a word, between all these different groups that comprise the Tea Party. In other words, the guy who's a big Second Amendment uh, gun guy, NRA guy, probably also thinks, you know what, the government does spend too much money. We need to reduce that. So he's got a lot in common with that fiscal conservative over there. And meanwhile, the social conservative like me says, hey, you know what, the right to bear arms, that is a pretty critical thing for defending our property and defending ourselves from a tyrannical government. So even though my pet issue might be the social conservatism, hey, that Second Amendment guy, he's spot on too. So we all kind of interact, work together. The, the, uh, the, the conspiracy theory guy, whoever he thinks is out there, well, I might think, you know what? I may not believe a lot of what that guy says, but I'm seeing enough chicanery from this administration that I can't dismiss it either. So there's a lot of redundancy within the various groups within the Tea Party. But what really unifies us? A lot of redundancy. But what the political commentators and the Republican Party themselves, the Republican leadership, does not understand is that among all these different groups, all this diversity within the Tea Party, there are really two subjects that unify all of us. The first is taxation. We are all against raising taxes. We are all against any additional kinds of taxes. In fact, you remember back in 1992 when... Uh, well, before that, when George H.W. Bush, as president, said, read my lips, no new taxes, he said that in 88. Well, he raised taxes, and in 92, he was shit-canned out of the Oval Office. Remember that? Okay, well, that sentiment, take that sentiment, put it on steroids, and that's how conservatives feel about taxes in 2014. So all of us, the Second Amendment guy, the fiscal conservative, the social conservative, the Alex Jones conspiracy theory guy, we're all against raising taxes. So like if you raise taxes and you're a Republican, you're going to galvanize all of us and we're going to make sure you're thrown out of office. Likewise, there's a second category, a second subject that unifies all. And that second category is immigration. 
And that's the one I think that a lot of people have lost sight over. The fiscal conservative, Second Amendment guy, social conservative, the conspiracy theorist. We all are scared to death of all this illegal immigration that's going on and the crime it causes. Not to mention the, the fiscal impact on our country. So illegal immigration is an issue that galvanizes everybody on the hard right, everybody in the Tea Party, including me. Well, when you have a situation where you've got an Eric Cantor who tried to make himself look like a Tea Partier at one point, but really has become a Washington establishment Republican type, and he's in there with an opponent who really ran a one-issue campaign, that issue being immigration, and that small fry, that primary challenger, David Bratt, who raised only $200,000 for his campaign against the $5.5 million that Eric Cantor raised, and Bratt beats him by 11 points. That should tell you how serious a lot of people in this country take the concept of immigration. It should tell you that when there are calls for a so-called immigration reform, which always amounts to amnesty by every plan I've seen, that we're not going to forget that. We're not going to let that slide by the wayside. We are not going to negotiate on that issue no more than we're going to allow you to negotiate on taxes. Those are deal breakers. If you part from the Tea Party on either one of those two issues, you will be finished. We can agree with you on 95% of everything else you talk about. But if you try to give amnesty to illegal aliens... We will finish your career. We can agree with you on 95% of everything else you talk about. But if you ever raise taxes, we will finish your career. There are certain very few topics that are deal breakers to the modern Tea Party. And Eric Cantor, maybe unknowingly, stumbled across one. Closing, you got to remember this about the Tea Party. Party loyalty is really a meaningless concept to us. We're not going to be persuaded by, well, you got to do the right thing for the Republican Party. Frankly, most of us look at the last 20 years of the Republican Party and we're not impressed. So we really don't care if the Republican Party survives or not. If it does survive, then it needs to be because it's a shell for us. Any other kind of Republican Party can rot in hell right alongside the Democrats. If you betray our core principles, our deal breaker issues. If you betray us on illegal immigration, which by the way is no longer just a border state issue. The South is galvanized by this. The Midwest is galvanized by this. I mean, a lot of us go into our own city and it happens to me here in the St. Louis area. We go into our own city. We're driving down the road and we see a building with, you know, a building with, with, with writing in Spanish on it, like a supermarket, but it doesn't say grocery store or supermarket outside. It says supermercado. We see that. So we're constantly reminded of the illegal immigration problem. We're constantly reminded of immigrants who are refusing to assimilate into our society. And we understand that's a one-way trip to a dead civilization. So if you're a Republican and you embrace that concept... We will destroy you, just like we will if you raise taxes. And it doesn't matter how much you've been on our side in the past. It doesn't matter what other issues we've agreed on. Those two specific issues are the unpardonable sin. They are the scarlet letter in conservative politics today. In the end, this victory was about forcing public servants to be reflexive to the demands of the voters. We hear so many people talk about how politicians and office holders are leaders. No, no, no. That's not the way to look at it. Politicians, representatives, senators, presidents are not leaders for Americans. Instead, it is the Americans, it is the voters who are supposed to lead the politicians. And you saw a little bit of that leadership in Eric Cantor's primary. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.